Hey, everybody. Don't you love technology? We're learning. We're learning this, and we're getting better. Thank you, God. Thank you, Rusty, for helping me. You're a good man. So this is the deal. We're going to see this video, and hopefully from here on out, it's going to flow just like we want. So let's watch this video. Thanks for coming. Let's watch the video. And if it hey, doesn't, there we go. Thank you for being here Thanks. today with us at Grace Christian Church on Easter Sunday. We are excited to have you here today. We're blessed to uh, be able to worship Jesus uh, on the day that he resurrected from the grave. What a blessing. So I want to encourage you today to be ready to worship him and, and let's hear from him what God has for us. Today, we're also going to be taking communion, so uh, if you want to get that stuff ready when you get a chance, you can go ahead and do that. The good part about being at home is you can pause us and get back to it. I just don't know how that actually goes when it's live. I'm not too sure, but anyway, you can do that. Um, it's good to have you again with us, and I'm going to go ahead and open up with prayer. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you. We want to give you all the glory. And all of our praise. God, we are so blessed that you love us enough. God, to, to invite us into your family. To make a choice to be your children. God, we thank you that we have that opportunity. Father, please help us today to lift our hands in worship of you. To set aside all the things that, that, have, that have been keeping us busy and set aside the things that are ahead that we may be worried about. God, help us to just focus right now on this service. Right now on what you're doing corporately with, with all of us that are watching, wherever we are watching today. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's be ready. We're going to enter into a time of worship. You ready? Here we go.
One of the great things that we can do together as a family is have communion. This is a memorial that Jesus started at the Last Supper just before he was crucified the next day. And he tells us to do this in remembrance of him. Do you have any memorials in your own family that you can look back to great successes? Well, this was the greatest success that ever took place in humanity when Jesus came and gave his life for us so that we could be saved, so that we could get rid of our sins and give our life to him. 
You know, the book of Romans is an amazing book. It, it, it deals with the subject of righteousness and imputed righteousness. You know, it, it's not something that we were able to just go out and do. We can't do it on our own. It's something that he gives us. Uh, it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted for righteousness. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave us right. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. In Romans 8, it says, there's no condemnation. That's an amazing, that's an amazing verse. No condemnation. But where do we get that? It's in the next phrase, in Christ. And then it ends with no separation. So this is such an important part of our, uh, of our life, especially during our Christian life, I should say, during uh, this Easter se season. This is the resurrection. This is the time that we celebrate Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Amen? And so that's what we're going to do tonight. And in, in Ephesians is, is such an important, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who blessed us with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And that's an indication in verse 20. He says that God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in heavenly places. And in verse 6 of chapter 2, it says that we're seated with him in heavenly places. What an amazing thing. But chapter 1 describes all those spiritual blessings. And so that's what we're celebrating today is all the spiritual blessings that Jesus gave us as a result of the cross of Calvary. And so first of all, we're going to start with, with the, the cracker. In a minute, I'll serve my daughter and we'll take it. But right now, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He broke bread. He broke it. And he said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when we take this, what are we remembering? We're remembering everything that Jesus took on his body. Every time he was whipped. The nails in his hand. The crushing crown of thorns and the spear that went up his side. These were all done to his body. He himself bore in his own body our sins. That we, mean, being dead to sin, may live to Christ, and by whose stripes we were healed. What an amazing event. So let's take the cracker and, and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the wounds. We thank you for the wounds. We thank you, Lord God, for everything that you took on your body for us, Lord God. And then your blood came down, and we're going to be talking about the blood in a minute. And the blood came down. And Lord God, it, without the shedding of blood, there's no remissions of sin. So right now, we partake of the cracker in Jesus' name. Amen. for participating with us in this communion service. Next, we will be partaking of the, of the grape juice. Or if you have wine, you can take wine, whatever uh, you feel is necessary. Here's the next phrase, verse 25 in chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. It says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. He's talking about a covenant. We, you can go back through the Old Testament and read about all the covenants that he made, but this covenant was, was the most important covenant that he ever made because he sent his own son down here to do it for us by shedding his own blood. This do, often as you drink, Drink it in remembrance of me. So, Jenna.
We're partaking right now of grape juice in remembrance of what Jesus did for us on Calvary when he shed his blood. Father, we thank you for the blood. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood washes away every sin. Nothing but the blood. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for participating with us with the, the communion today. God bless you. All right. Well, God, we just thank you for a chance to hear from you, the, your message right now. God, speak to our hearts. God, open up our ears to, to hear. Open my ears. Father, my ears to hear what you're saying to us today. God, I know what you've put on our hearts, on my heart, and, and what I've studied. But God, you know exactly what we need right now. So please, use me as your vessel, God, to speak the words that we all need to hear. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, <clears throat> Last week, I spoke about Jesus' triumphal entry, and we, we talked about uh, John chapter 12, starting at verse 12 and, and verse 13. It was dealing with Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and he, he was coming into a place where uh, the people were worshiping him, welcoming, welcoming him into Jerusalem. They were laying their coats on the, on the ground, they were laying their, they were laying palm branches that they'd, that they'd rip off a tree and, and on the ground, like, like, a, like a red carpet treatment to, to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem. I think as they were thinking about it, they were thinking about how, how this is that, that king that's to come. This is Messiah. He's the one. They were giving him that royal treatment. Sing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But you know what? What's so interesting is only a few days later would, would they be chanting, crucify him, crucify him. It, it really shows how easily swayed we are in our thought process when, when things aren't going the way that we think they should go. We, we have circumstances happen and all of a sudden our mind goes, no, it, it can't be that way. I, I thought it was going to be this way. And then we, we start to panic and we go, this is the problem. This is going to be it. No, uh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And God is saying, I want you to put your trust in me. Let me be the anchor that you hold on to. Let, let's not have fear be the anchor because we hold on to fear. We grab hold of fear when it's coming and, and it's like, man, fear, this is so important. I gotta grab hold of fear. I gotta grab hold of, of scaredness and, and I'm gonna hold on to this thing because this is, this, it's so wonderful to hold on to. No, it's not. You know that's a lie. It's not wonderful to hold on to fear and, and, and worry and stress. Jesus said this. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that more abundantly. God has called us to an abundant life. He hasn't called us to a life of fear. We've got to get past this thought of always grabbing hold to the negative. The negative. Abundant life is about positive. Fear is about negative. The enemy, the devil, he wants you to grab hold of what he is in control of because he thinks that you will, will hold on to that and, and not be able to grab hold of salvation because the minute you grab hold of salvation, the minute that salvation grabs hold of you, the minute that you choose in your heart to, to totally believe in Jesus is the minute that the enemy has, is losing grip. He's going to try to grab you back. He's going to try to make you fear and worry. He's going to try to, to put um, 
other things in your life that, you, that you've come out of and, and try to re get you back involved in the things that you, that you gave up because Jesus changed your heart. The enemy wants you back, but God wants you more. God loves you more. What has the enemy given you? What, he, what has he truly given you that is a blessing for the rest of your life? You know, there's, the Bible says that sin is fun for a season. But it's only for a season. Why? Because it's, it reaps its rewards. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. That which a man sows, he's going to reap. So if we sow into our flesh corruption, if we sow into our flesh the things that, that push God aside, then what we're going to get is corruption. And Jesus came so that we could have life eternal, so that we could sow to the flesh joy and peace. We can sow to the flesh the things that he has for us. What is the biggest thing God has for us? It's love. It's love. God loves us so much. He loves us so much. That's what today's message is about. It's about the love of God. This is Easter Sunday. This is the Sunday where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross because he loved us enough. He died on the cross. He took the shame. He took the, the, all the stuff that people did to him because he loved us and wants to be with us. Let's go on. Jeremiah 31.3 says this. The Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God has drawn us to his side. He's drawn us to a, is, is drawing us to a point so that we can be with him. The Bible says in, in 1 John that, that God is love. Man, who doesn't want to be with love? I want to be with love. I don't like to be in the presence of hate. I don't like to be in the presence of discord. I don't like to be in the presence of death. I want to be in God's presence. And I want to encourage you. Trust him. Let's, let's hear about this. Let, let's think about this. This is the deal. I, was, I, I wrote down this. Um, we see how easily we can be swayed. That's what the children of Israel, not the children of Israel, but the people in Jerusalem, they were, they were worshiping Jesus as he was coming in on Monday. Okay? Maybe it was Sunday. Maybe I have it wrong. But, but the beginning of the week, he comes in. That's Sunday. He comes in at the beginning of the week. They're worshiping Jesus. Within a few days, they're cursing Jesus. They're coming against Jesus. In fact, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think, it was, I think it was on Tuesday is when he went to, to Lazarus' house to, to uh, eat with him. He had raised Lazarus from the dead uh, some time before, not necessarily last week. I don't know how long apart it was. But when he came to Lazarus' house, they made a, a meal for him. And, and it wasn't just a meal. It was kind of like a banquet. It was kind of like one of those things where, where there was a lot of people there. In fact, enough of the word got out. I don't, think they, I don't think they sent it out on Instagram. And I think Facebook was, I think it was down at the time. Um, somehow the word got out. And it actually got out by word of mouth. It got out by the people saying, hey, Jesus is coming to town. And guess where he's going? He's going to Lazarus' house. Remember Lazarus? Remember the guy who was dead and is now living again? Yeah, they're going to his house. So the people came. And the Pharisees heard about it too. And so they came. And they wanted to see what was going on. And they're like, oh, what are we going to do? These people are believing in Jesus, and he is not the way, the truth, and the life. He is a lie. He is a lie. He is a lie. You know what? The, the devil wants you to believe a lie. And, and these guys were believing the lie. They were religious leaders. They studied. But the question is, did they? And, and that's my question for you and, and for me. Do you? Do we, do we even know what tomorrow holds? Do we even have a clue what we want to see our future to be? We may have these ideas and these thoughts, but God has a, a plan for our lives if we just trust him with our life. 
He has a plan. He has a purpose for you. You may think, well, I'm just this, or I, I just live here. I, I just live in Parowan. It's such a small little town. What can I do? And you can make a difference. You can make a difference in the life of your neighbor that lives next door to you. You can make a difference in, in the life of the, of the, the guy that's, that's doing your groceries at Walmart. Love him. That's the difference you can make. And you never know how much of a, of a blessing you can be on the life of somebody that's just needing a smile. Just needing somebody to encourage them. We need to know what we believe. We need to understand it so that we're not swayed as soon as, as, soon as the storm winds come and things go, don't go the way we think. We don't need to be swayed and go the way of the storm. We need to be standing firm on the rock of Jesus and the faith in him knowing that he will take care of us. He will walk with us. And if you remember the story of the footprints in the sand, the time that we only see one set of footprints is when he's carrying us. That's not biblical. That's not the Bible. It doesn't, it's, you don't find that in the Bible. I'm not saying it's not biblical. I believe Jesus carries us. He says, my, take my burden. It's, it's my, my burden is light. He says, take of me. I'm not the one. You, you don't have to hold it. You don't have to carry it. I will help you. Yoke up with me. And that's what God is calling us to do. So here we go. Let's, let's go back. These guys were swayed. Why? Because they didn't have a solid understanding of, of who Jesus was. They had heard who he was, but they didn't really have a deep understanding. That's what I'm calling us to do. If we believe, we need to have a solid understanding and a conviction and a belief and a true belief in what we believe is true. If we say that Jesus is is God's son, if we say that Jesus is, like in John 1, 1, Jesus is the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. The word, Jesus, we read down, I think it's in verse 14 of chapter one of John. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. That's God in the flesh. He came to live amongst us so that we could have life. Yeah, you hear the story. I, there was a story, um, and, and, and I'll, I'll just, it's a story, okay? I'm just going to tell you this. It may be real, but I'm going to tell you a story, and if I don't get it just right because you heard it one way, don't worry about it. It's a story. I'm not saying it's biblical. I'm not saying it's, it's, uh, it's gospel truth. Just listen to my story. Here it is. So there's this guy plowing his field, and I believe he's probably a Hindu or something like that, and, and not against Hindus, but he's probably a Hindu, and he's, he's plowing his field, and he comes up to an ant hill, and he doesn't want to hurt the ants, okay, because they're a living creature, God's creatures, and he, they, they feel like this ant has some importance. And I'm not saying an ant doesn't. I, I'm not real fond of ants when they bite me. I, I'm not real kind to them. I think I squish them. Um, but anyway, he's sitting there thinking, how do I get these ants to, to understand me? He's talking to these ants. Hey, you guys need to move. I got to plow this field. I got to get some corn in the ground. I got to get some wheat in the ground. I got to feed my family. You guys got to move. And they can't. They won't because they don't understand him. So the story is kind of like that. It's, it's like God is speaking to us for years through prophets and, and things like that. And, 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 and we're not hearing him. So Jesus came so that we could hear God. Now, it's a story. It's a story. It's, this, is the, this, is the, this is the gospel. The gospel means the good news. The gospel is this. We are desperate sinners. The Bible says it. It says our righteousness is like filthy rags. Our goodness is as, as good as, as shop towels that are full of grease. Nah, that's probably not even that bad. They're worse. Our righteousness is not good compared to God's righteousness. God's righteousness is amazing. Have you, have you ever done anything wrong? If you've done anything wrong, you're a sinner, just like me. If you've ever lied, you're a sinner. If, you're, if you ever uh, hated somebody in your heart, you're a murderer. That's what the Bible says. 
You're like, whoa, I've never thought about killing somebody. Well, actually, you probably have. <laughs> and I'm sorry. So have I. And it wasn't you, unless you're watching now, and I may have, and I apologize. Don't do it again. Anyway, point is, we are all sinners. We have all come short of the glory of God. We've, we need salvation in God. But God made a way, and that's through Jesus Christ. That, that's what the Bible says. In, in, in Romans 6.23, it says, The wages of sin, the, the price that we get paid the, for sin is death. So, you go to work, you do your job, you get a paycheck. You go to life, and you sin, and your paycheck is death. It's what it is. Just telling you. Either heaven or hell. Or right or left. Maybe heaven's on the right and hell's on the left. I don't care. I just want to be in the presence of God. And the only way that's going to happen is if I trust him with my life. So let's go on. We need to know what we believe. And we need to totally understand it. And I'm going to show you why it's... I want to show you a good reason, other than not wanting to go to hell, a good reason to serve Jesus. The biggest reason is that he loves you. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you more than you can even imagine. Jesus came out of the grave because he wants to be by your side. He wants you to be by his side. Jesus is not looking for clean, happy, and sinless people. I mean, he'd, sure, he'd love that. But actually, he's looking for downtrodden and lonely and, and sinful, those that are desperate for him, those that realize their sin. You, you see in the Bible the, the, the two men that are, that are paying their tithes. You see the, the Pharisee who's going, God, look at me, thank you, here's my money. Thank God I'm not like that guy over there. I, I fast, I give tithes, I, I do this, I do that. And then you see this guy over here, and he is, he is down on his knees. He's the tax collector. He's down on his knees saying, God, please forgive me. God, I'm a sinner. That's what Jesus does for us. He forgives us if we ask. If we ask. He loves us more than you can ever imagine. Since I believe it's important that we know what we believe, let's go over a few things right here. Go to Mark chapter 14, verse 36. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. I'll wait a second. Wait, wait for you to be able to pull it up on your phone. Or open your Bible. Okay, took too long, sorry. Anyway, please understand that Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen to him. Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen to him. He knew when he was going to the cross, he knew what was gonna happen. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not, that, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is just a few days after his triumphal entry. He, is, he just left the, the Last Supper, and he, he took his disciples, uh, three of his disciples with him and asked them to pray with him. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying because he knew within just a short time, like, like hours maybe, or even maybe even minutes, he knew that Judas was going to come with a band of soldiers to take him away. He knew what was coming. Jesus created his, his body. He created, he created the, uh, our, our, our bodies, okay? He created the human body, which he was living in at the time as God in the flesh, and he created the, the, the nerve endings. He created the, the blood. He cre cre created everything. He knew that when he was going to get whipped just a few hours later, that his skin would rip and, 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 his, and his flesh would feel the pain of, of the whipping. He knew that he would, he would get beaten by the soldiers. He knew that, he, he knew that was coming. The Bible says he knows the beginning from the end because he is the word of God. He knows what's about to happen. And he still decided to go to the cross for you and for me. In John chapter two, 
Starting in verse 19, it says, Jesus answered them saying, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews says, it has taken us 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body because he knew that he was going to be raised up again. And he was saying, destroy this temple and it'll be raised up in three days. He didn't say it that way, destroy this temple. He was talking about it. But that's what he's doing. He, he knew what was going to happen, and he still chose to go to the cross for us. Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 45, says this. Now from about the, the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, this is, this is Jesus is on the cross at this point. Jesus is nailed to the cross. He's up on the cross, and he's in agony. He's in pain where they drove the nails through his, his hands or through his wrist. The, their nerve endings were horrendously damaged. And it says that his, that his arms, there were shooting pains in his arms. And his, his feet were crossed. They were nailed to the cross. And the only way that he could, could breathe was to push off with his feet up so his lungs could open up. Because when he hang, hung there, as the, as the nails and the skin was pulling against the nails, his, his lungs would, in a sense, like collapse. They wouldn't be able to fill with air, so he'd have to push up again. He had to do this a lot. Why? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I just want to pause here just for a second. Um, the reason he did that, prior to him being on the cross, Jesus was sinless, was perfect. Never did anything wrong. Never did anything that was displeasing to God. He was sinless. But while he was on the cross, he took the sins of the entire world on him. And I'm going to read you some verses right here that talk about that. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. That's all of us. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on Jesus, on him, the iniquity of us all. God put that on Jesus while he was on the cross. In 1 John 2, 2, it says, And he himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He's the payment. He's the one that pays the price for our sins. Jesus is. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says this. Talking about Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. And then it says this. By whose stripes we are healed. By whose stripes you were healed. When Jesus was whipped, each of those lashes that went across his body was healing for us, for the believers that trust in him. That's what the Bible says. Want to talk about an abundant life? That's part of an abundant life. The healing touch of Jesus in your life. When you choose to follow the enemy, he doesn't have that for you. He doesn't have those blessings and those benefits. Thank you, God, that we chose years ago to follow you. So after he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It says, some of those who stood nearby, this is verse, 40, verse 47 of uh, Matthew chapter 27. Some of those who stood by, when they heard that, this, it says, this man is calling out for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and, and put it on a reed and offered it for him to drink. And then it, it says, the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit, yielded up the ghost. He, he, he gave his life up. So understand this. Jesus gave his life up for us. He gave it up for you so that you could have eternal life. But this isn't the end of the story. When he died is not the end of the story. The devil, when Jesus died, the devil is cheering the devil is excited. Yes, we've killed him. He is dead. You know, the devil's a created being. The devil was, uh, is not God. 
The devil is not Jesus' brother. The devil is a created being. He was an angel in heaven that was, that was the head of, of worship in heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. Probably jammed you up with that cough in the mic. I'm sorry. Jesus, excuse me, the devil was a worship leader in heaven and he became proud and prideful. And God said, nope, you're out of here because he tried to put himself above God. And God said, no, you're out. He's a, he was a created being. He's not related to Jesus, okay? You gotta understand that. Jesus says this, that he gave up his spirit. He yielded up his spirit to God. He gave it up so that we could have life with him. He gave his life. Nobody had the power to take it from him. He allowed the people, allowed the people to crucify him. That's how much he loves us. He knew that without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sins. Your sins could not be washed away forever if Jesus hadn't died on the cross for you. But this is the exciting part. It says in verse 51, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You guys, listen, you need to go to Matthew chapter 27 and read this for yourself. You need to see this. This is so amazing. The veil of the temple was torn in uh, in two from top to bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, who who had died before, were raised And they came out of the graves after his resurrection, which is what we're about to get excited about, after his resurrection, and they went into the holy city and appeared to many. They had eyewitnesses of this. They had eyewitnesses of this. This is historical stuff. So then it says, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw that the earthquake, uh, saw the earthquake and and these things that had happened, They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and mother and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Then it says, now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who himself had become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite of the tomb. Now let's go on. This is verse 62 of that chapter. On the next day, when, uh, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say to the people, he has risen from the dead so that the last deception will be worse than the first. So, it says, Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how to. So they went and made the tomb, the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now, we're going on to Matthew chapter 28. And this is, the, this is where we are. We're on resurrection day. It says on Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse one, it says, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven heaven, and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. This angel came from heaven, rolled the stone away and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. You know, I, I, uh, I read something uh, when I was studying. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a, an article written 
in uh, www.veritas.org. Um, and and it's, the article is, Can Scientists Believe Resurrection? With three hypotheses. It says, Can a scientist believe in the resurrection? And if you read the article, it's, it's really interesting. But this guy, is he's a, his name is Ian Hutchinson. He's an MIT professor. Um, and he said, you know what? Not only do I, as a, a scientist and, a, and an MIT professor, believe in Jesus and, and his resurrection, but many of my colleagues do as well. What does science do? Science studies the facts and says this is how things go. And it, one of his statements he basically said was this. Um, we cannot prove that the res- resurrection happened by any hypothesis, but we also can't disprove that the resurrection happened by any hypothesis or any any verifiable thing. We can't up we can't prove it or disprove it. So therefore, it's w- there's nothing that in science that says the resurrection didn't happen. But you know what he said? He said, "Look at all the accounts you read in your Bible, and in fact, you can you can read stories from." Eusebius and, and Josephus, who are Jewish historians, how uh, that, that actually interviewed, if I'm not mistaken, Eusebius interviewed people that knew of people at the time that were actually eyewitnesses to the event. We have eyewitnesses. There are eyewitnesses that, that saw the event happen. There are eyewitnesses, as you read in, in the different Gospels, that uh, over 500 people at one time saw Jesus after he were resurrected. There are so many of them. Resurrection. It's amazing. His power is amazing. The angel rolled away the stone, sat on top of the stone, and you had a whole bunch of scared people. It says, <clears throat> uh, verse 3 of chapter 28 of Matthew, it says, His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. It says, but the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And as he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And in verse nine, it says, and as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. So let's go on to verse 11. This is, this is the part that's really interesting. This is the part where, where the devil comes in and goes, oh my goodness, we got a problem. Houston, we got a problem. There's a situation going on here. We got to fix it. Here we go. Verse 11, it says, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported, re- reported, reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while you slept. And if, there's, if this comes to the, the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. It's commonly reported that the disciples stole him. But you know what? Um, It's so interesting. He was seen by over 500 people uh, at one time, and probably in the the region of Galilee, where uh, through studying, I I, I see that that was most of his miracles, and most of the people followed him in that area. But he was was hanging around with the disciples for another 40 days, teaching them. And, and, and talking about what he had said was going to happen and how it happened and talking about the things to come. In fact, the book of John, near the end of the book of John, uh, he talks about th- this is all written down so that you might believe. And he says, if it's possible, I, there's so many more things I could write. If there was enough 
books in the world to make. He said, basically, I, I, this is my thought. It's, I, I read this, I, I, I liked it. Um, in that 40 days that Jesus was teaching them, he taught them so much stuff. He taught them so much stuff. He encouraged them. Tell me, your faith wouldn't be built up if you saw Jesus resurrect in front of you. I mean, he, he, you know that he died. You saw him crucified. You put his body in the grave. And then three days later, he's alive. He's, he's walking into a room, a locked room. He walks in. There's, you got to read your Bible. I'm telling you, there's some cool stories in it. But Jesus even ate with the disciples. Ate with them. If you're dead, you're not eating. Okay? Um, if you're a spirit, you're not eating. Jesus ate with him. In fact, there was a time, the first time he was with him, uh, Thomas wasn't there. So the second time uh, he, was, he was with him, Thomas had made it. Well, what happened with Thomas? Thomas, poor guy. They, they, they call him Doubting Thomas. Why? Because he said, yeah, I don't believe you guys. Unless I see him, unless I stick my finger in his, in his holes on his hands, and unless I stick my, shove my, my, my arm up his, up his side, I ain't going to believe him. I ain't going to believe it was him. And so what happens? He comes a second time while they're all there and Thomas is there. And he goes up to Thomas. He goes, hey, stick your finger in there, baby. No, he didn't say baby. I'm sorry. But he, stick your finger in, right? He says, thrust your hand into my side. And he did. He felt it. He, it, he was tangible. I'm telling you, there's so much more to Jesus than we could even imagine. Jesus is legit, and serving him is legit, and trusting him with your life is legit. I could say legit probably a thousand more times. It won't matter if you don't get it. Know of whom you believe. Why should you believe in Jesus? Because he loves you more than you can imagine. He died on the cross so that you could live. The Bible says this uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, we're looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God, right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, he says, for the joy that was set before him. Did you know what's the joy set before him? You. You. You, me, we were the joy set before him. Why would he have to go to the cross? Because it's the thing to do? Let's go to the cross today. I don't think so. He went to the cross because he loved you so much. Because he knew that you couldn't be good enough to make it to heaven. He knew that you couldn't be good enough and he'd just cover the rest. That's a bunch of crock. Jesus knew that you needed salvation. We need salvation. He's not waiting for you to get cleaned up to come to heaven. It's not going to happen. You're never going to be good enough to make it to heaven on your own. You're not. I'm sorry. But how you are right now, whether you're in, in a specific sin or, or whatever the situation is, he's reaching out to you. He's telling you, I love you. I died on the cross for you. I gave myself so that you could live. Come to me. Trust me with your life. That's what God's doing. He, he wants you to trust Jesus so that you can have eternal life. You may not know it. Though he was waiting for you at the cross, you, are, you have been waiting for him. You. You've been waiting for him. You've been waiting for this moment. You've been wanting to, to, to see and know that Jesus loves you or that somebody loves you. Somebody cares about you. Listen, people are going to fail you all over the place. They just are. And, and forgive them. You've failed people before. Give them a break. But understand this. Jesus will never fail you. We may not understand why, why some things happen. We may not understand why God allowed this to happen or that to happen. But in reality, he's never failed us. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what's best for us. And he's going to bring us through it. You have been waiting for this moment. 
Jesus is calling out to you. You didn't, you didn't log in to your Facebook to see this or YouTube to see this uh, by accident. There's no coincidences, I'm telling you. There's not. There's a God in heaven who has created this great symphony that's able to bring in the piccolos when they need to and the oboe when it needs to and that bass drum when it needs to. And you right now are probably that bass drum that he's, he's calling you into the picture so that you can hear from him, so that you can be used by him to come into relationship with him, then so you can be used by him to go out and make a difference in somebody's el- somebody else's life. God is calling you to that. He isn't saying stay as you are, but he is saying to you he loves you unconditionally. Come to him. He will change you. He will change the things inside of you. After you give your heart to him, he will change you. He will work on those things. But you have to come to him with a heart of repentance. You have to come to him and realizing that you are in need of him. You have to believe. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, this is found in the book of Romans chapter 9, excuse me, chapter 10, verse 9. Verses 9 and 10, really check them out. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Go on to read the rest of chapter of, of verse 10. It, it's a great verse to read. God wants us. He will help us to see how much we love him. He will help us to, to, to want to please him. When we become a Christian, when we give our hearts to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in and and starts doing a work inside of us and changing our desires. You may say, man, but I like this one thing. Yeah, well, you can like it to hell. That's the problem. And you know what? Sometimes the things that you like aren't necessarily things that are going to send you to hell. So don't don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Man, I really like doing this, so I don't want to follow Jesus. Man, that's a lie of the devil. He doesn't want you to follow Jesus, so he's going to encourage you to not follow Jesus. You say no and say, I want Jesus. And listen, you don't have to come to my church. And this is not my church. This is God's church, okay? You don't have to come to this church. You just need to come to Jesus. You need to, you need to check out Jesus of the Bible and see who he is and come into relationship with him and then find yourself a good Bible-believing church and, 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 and get immersed in the word of God. Build relationship with people. I'm telling you, this time with the COVID-19 thing, it's, it's rough. It's hard because why? We're not physically able to, to hang out together. And that's a deal. The Bible says to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We're not doing that. We're not. We're, we're actually honoring people. We're honoring our government who says, please don't assemble together. Why? Because if you do, there's a chance you could spread it, which could continue to spread it. So we're honoring God and honoring our authorities by not having a church service physically here. But that's not the way God really wants it. And the government's not telling us to do something that's against God. So don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, we need to be together. It's hard when we're not together. It's hard when we don't have somebody to, to, en- to encourage us face to face. Sure, FaceTime, that's a great thing. Sure, watching me on YouTube or or. Facebook or whatever, and remember, if you like it, hit the, what is it, the like button on YouTube, no, Facebook, I think, and, and hit the, the subscribe button on YouTube. And don't, you don't have to worry about that stuff. Point is, God wants us to have relationship with each other. And I can't wait to that point where we can get back together and have relationship. That's why it's important for you to find a good Bible-believing church where you can go and have fellowship with people that have the same mind that you do. A people, a group of people that, that love Jesus. And listen, a group of people that love Jesus are gonna love other people. They're not gonna be mean, they're not gonna be ugly. Those are things that we've gotta change in us, the mean and ugly. God is calling us to relationship with him. He will change your desires. He will change the things that aren't best for us. And that's what we need. Don't wait to change to come to him. Don't wait to change. I'm not good enough to come to Jesus. You're not. Get over it. None of us are. So don't wait. Just come to him and say, I need you, God. Please forgive me, a sinner. God, like the publican, like the tax collector, please forgive me. He was beating his chest. 
Please forgive me a sinner, God. And when he does that, he wipes away that sin. And the Bible says he remembers it no more. So when the devil brings it up to you again, you can go, no, 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 that was, that was washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's not mine to hold on to anymore. And that's not mine to go back to anymore. Not like a, like a dog that returns to his vomit. Once you get rid of the sin, let it go. Let it go, let it go. I don't know how that song goes. But anyway, I, I, it's actually let us know. I get it, I know. Um, and I, I watched this poor lady during this time. I think it was actually a joke, but it was on one of those Facebook or something like that. And this, this lady says, if I have to watch Frozen another time, I'm gonna go mad. Yeah, well, actually, I don't have that problem with my kids. Um, we have a great time hanging out together and, and doing homeschool. What a blessing. What a blessing. You, you homeschool, you parents that are thinking this is a curse, um, change your mindset. Change your mindset. Choose to say, God, what a blessing that I get to a, I get a hang out with the thing that I created. Right? Because, I mean, you did. You and your husband got together. Here you go. Enjoy it. Enjoy hanging out with your kids. And if you don't, Pray, pray that God will change your heart and change them. And then, or maybe even change you. <laughs> maybe, well, anyway. Sometimes our kids aren't the problem, eh? Let's go on. 2 Timothy 2, verses three through four says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. There's a, a little picture, and I, I hope it actually gets on there for you. There's a little picture. I was thinking about Uncle Sam pointing out, you know, I want you. Well, I got this picture, um, and, and <clears throat> hopefully the, the artist gets credit for it. Um, but it's, it's of Uncle Sam, except it's Jesus' face. He's wearing a crown of thorns, and he wants you for his army. Now, the army of God isn't this militant, mean I want to kill everybody army. It's an army to go out and, and, and love people and bring them into relationship with God. Remember, Jesus came to give us life and that more abundantly and, and that's what I'm encouraging you to do right now is make a choice. Choose him. Choose Jesus. Choose eternal life. And for those of you that are thinking, man, this is, this is a message I didn't need to hear because I'm already saved. Well, Praise the Lord. I'm glad you're saved. Thank God. But what are you going to do with it? Is this maybe just another message that has helped us grow in relationship with God so that we can understand more of who we are in Him so that we can give it to somebody else? Father, I thank you. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. God, thank you for loving us. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us. Holy Spirit, thank you for indwelling us as believers and helping us to live for God and helping us to love those around us. God, we thank you and we praise you. Help us to honor you not only today on Resurrection Sunday, but help us, God, to honor you with our lives from this day on. Brand new life in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. You guys have a excellent blessed week from here on out serving him god bless you give me a sign when you're ready it's on you they're seeing you okay um press the uh look down on the bottom <laughs> I wonder why I went off that. Hey, everybody. Okay. <laughs> We're learning this thing. Um, just real quick. We, uh, we appreciate you being here, and we want to increase uh, what God's doing. We want to bless him and bless you. So right now we're going to give you a chance to give, um, and uh, you don't have to. Uh, if you have a church that you go to, that's where your tithe belongs to. It doesn't belong here with us. Um, but if this is your church, you want to tithe, go ahead. If you want to give, you're welcome to go ahead. I'm going to give you a slide in just a second that, that says it, um, and then we're done. And you don't have to give it all. Uh, we, we just want to give to you by giving what God has. Hey, 
Bless you guys. Thank you. I'm going to try to hit this giving thing, and we'll go from there. <laughs>